So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Lauren Griffith. She's an associate professor in the Department of Health Research, Methods, Evidence, and Impact at McMaster University. She holds the McLaughlin Foundation Professorship in Population and Public Health, and she's a co-PI of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging and the lead of the Hamilton Data Collection Site, and I'm privileged to work with her. And her research interests include physical functioning, frailty, and aging, as well as the harmonization of longitudinal data. Lauren, please. Just make sure I know how to use this. I didn't realize when I made my talk that I was going to have the feel-good talk of our panel, talking about COVID-19 impacts on community living older adults. But I think one of the things that is important in this talk is thinking about this evidence base to help inform moving forward. And I think studies like the CLSA are going to be extremely important in that regard. So I'm going to talk about the CLSA, talk a little bit about it as a, just a brief introduction of, the, of what it is. Um, I'm going to talk about the COVID studies that were embedded in the CLSA and primarily a survey study. And then I'm going to just hit on some of the findings that we found that I think are important. Uh, and these are findings from our, our entire research group and Marla presented some today. But I think they're really important things in terms of understanding COVID. So I'm going to be looking at symptoms, uh, mental health, and frailty. So just in terms of the CLSA as a research platform, we call it a research platform because it really is, we collect the data, but it's available to all researchers that want to study health and aging. There's over 50,000 people that were recruited at baseline. They were 45 to 85 when they were recruited. And then about 40% of them were a random sample from the 10 provinces in Canada, and they provide data through telephone interviewing. And about 60% are from more geographically restricted areas around 11 data collection sites across Canada. And they provide their data, very similar questionnaire data, in in-person interviews. But they also come to one of the data collection sites, like the one here at MIP, and they provide clinical measures as well as conduct physical tests. They provide blood and urine. And here you can see um, we started recruitment in 20 to 20, or 2010 to 2015. But every three years, we start a new wave of data collection. And of course, in the middle of follow-up two is when COVID happened. And one of the things about CLSA that actually helped us in terms of COVID and adjusting is that there was a really robust IT infrastructure and there was a lot of accommodation strategies already in place. So we were able, I think, within two weeks to start collecting data again. But the other thing was this opportunity to actually understand the importance of having these population-based data and these pre-existing cohort in terms of understanding COVID. And so we launched a COVID survey study. This gives you an idea of what the, what the uh, actual study looked like. But I think as Parminder mentioned yesterday, within a month of COVID happening, we were launching our survey study. So we had two longer interviews. We had a baseline interview where we collected kind of socio-demographic, some socio-demographic information, information on symptoms and, and COVID. Um, status, and but a number of other things like um, social variables, lifestyle variables, um, population, the uh, public health impacts, and and um, and uh, and as well uh, looking at um, you know healthcare access and things like that. And then, then there was the weekly, bi-weekly surveys. Those were mostly just kind of looking at symptoms and outcomes along the way. And then we had another similar exit interview where we had a number of things that were from the baseline, but we also introduced some things like loneliness and symptom persistence, things that we kind of learned that were important along the way. And that happened at kind of end of September to the end of December in 2020. So the first um, study I'm going to talk about is COVID symptoms and why is it important to, to look at COVID symptoms in terms of in uh, a population-based study. And one of the things we could do here is we know a lot about the symptoms people were presenting with 
when they had COVID, but we don't really know necessarily what the background rates were, what we would expect in the, in the community if we didn't have COVID. So we were able to look at that. And we were also able to look at persistent symptoms. So we were able, for the people that had COVID, we were able to look to see what were their persistent, or how often they had persistent symptoms, what they were, and as well, what were the pre-pandemic factors that were associated with symptom persistence. So the pre-pandemic factors were from a follow-up one for me, and then the symptoms were from the COVID exit survey. Oops, sorry, back. So here, it's a bit of a busy slide, but I think it really shows you in the, in the community, so to the right side are the symptoms that we saw in people that reported having COVID. The left were the, the burden of symptoms in people that did not have COVID, these symptoms that were related to COVID. And clearly you could see the dark part of these lines are people that had reported either severe or um, moderate symptoms. And so clearly there was a lot more symptoms reported in our COVID group and a lot more in terms of the moderate and severe. But one thing about having CLSA is we have a very large sample size too. So we can dig down a little bit deeper and look at what those symptoms looked like by age. And here you could see, I think we keep hearing things about the, the um, age effect in COVID. It was, it, in terms of the people getting it, it was more common in the younger age groups. But here you can see the symptoms were actually, the burden was higher in the younger age groups, but in the older age groups, you could see that there was more times moderate or severe symptoms. So we can start understanding this a little bit better. And in terms of persistent symptoms, it's actually interesting. In our community-based survey, we found similar um, prevalence of, of persistent symptoms as we were seeing in the hospitals at the time. So people that had less severe cases were still having these persistent symptoms. And so it was about two-thirds of the people had symptoms at one year, or sorry, one year, uh, more than one month. And about half the people reported having the symptoms more than three months later. And again, it's a bit of a busy slide, but for both one month and three months, um, we had the, the female sex was related to, so the, the females tended to have um, a higher risk of having persistent symptoms in males, both at one month and uh, three months. And as well, having more chronic conditions was associated with have more likely, a uh, higher likelihood of having persistent symptoms. But when we looked at the three month, time, having persistent symptoms for more than three months, it was also the subjective social status that came in. And it's kind of an interesting measure. This is one where you, you picture a ladder, people are asked to picture a ladder that have 10 rungs, that is really representing the social standing in, a committee, in, in your community. And the 10th rung is like the highest social standing, the first rung is the lowest. So we ask people to put themselves, which rung are you on? And what we found that an increase of one rung was actually associated with about a 15% decrease in the risk of reporting persistent symptoms at three months. So I, again, having this rich contextual data outside of COVID actually helps us to understand some of these things better. And so in terms of mental health, we looked at depression that was led by Dr. Reyna and loneliness, which was led by Dr. Kirkland from uh, Dalhousie. And here, again, we were able to actually look at trajectories because for depression, we had data from baseline to follow up one, and then COVID, the first COVID uh, interview, and then COVID exit. And for loneliness, it was introduced a little bit later, so we had the follow up one and the COVID exit. And what we found, this is a Globe and Mail uh, article that is reporting on um, Dr. Reyna's Nature Aging paper. But some of the things that we expected to see here, clearly you could see that the, the first column, the kind of burgundy one, is the pre-COVID. The kind of greenish one is at the beginning of COVID, and the more salmon-colored one is at the exit, or, or sorry, at the one-year point. And here you can see there's a big increase in the prevalence of depression 
from uh, pre-COVID to the beginning of COVID. And again, there's a bit of an increase for some groups, but not quite so high in terms of between the, um, the spring and the, and the end of year one for the pandemic. But what we found were things that we thought would, would, we would find in terms of living alone was much more, was important. There was a higher prevalence of depression and females had a higher depression, uh, prevalence of depression than males. But one of the kind of interesting things was when we look at income, so total household income, clearly the prevalence of depression um, is highest for the people that had the lowest level of income. But you can also see the impact from pre-pandemic to pandemic was much greater for the people that had higher levels of income. But one of the other things that came from this article is the strong association with pre-pandemic loneliness and depression. And so, um, we dug a little bit deeper into this in our loneliness study. And again, this is um, a, a, a figure that's looking at the predicted probability of loneliness. It's adjusted for all sorts of other factors. And what we see here is, again, the black squares are the pre-pandemic. The red circles are at the end of the first year. And we could see that there is a big increase in terms of loneliness for all groups. But it tends to be a bigger step, like we saw in depression, for those with high income. But one of the kind of interesting things here is if we actually look, it seems that the age effect, which again, we found the highest levels of loneliness in our, our youngest age group, but you could see the, the association with age is much stronger in the low income group than in the high income group. And again, having these large sample sizes allows you to sort some of these things out. So the last thing I'm going to present is looking at frailty in healthcare access challenges. And one of the things we were interested in doing, a lot of the public health um, directives and, and as well, even thinking about getting vaccinations, it was all age-based. But we were kind of interested in looking at frailty because we know that even in older adults, it's a very heterogeneous group. So we wanted to take a look at that. And here we use the frailty index as described earlier. And we looked at people who reported having challenges with access to health care. So specifically, I'm just presenting the primary care, specialist care, diagnostic tests and screening. But again, we were able to look at pre-pandemic levels of frailty and the other, other variables that we adjusted for, and then looked at what they reported in terms of access challenges. And what was kind of interesting is that we found overall that people with higher levels of frailty had more reported challenges with access to health care, which in ways make a sense because you would think that there's a higher need for health care as well. But when we broke this out then by age, we found that the oldest age group actually had the least impact in terms of frailty. So here we looked at frailty quartile, so four would be the people with the highest levels of frailty. And you could see the younger age groups with the highest level of frailty were the ones that were actually reporting the most, in, uh, most challenges in terms of access. And in primary care, there was, there was a clear divergence between the oldest and the other three age groups, but you can really see in terms of specialist care and as well diagnostic tests and screening tests that there's really this difference in this youngest age group. So here we're seeing that um, age may, in terms of level of frailty, actually was associated with getting less, um, having more challenges with access to healthcare. And this was after adjusting for all sorts of other factors. So I want to just end with, um, this advertisement slide, because I have to, because Parminder's here. And, but essentially, I, I really think data sets like the CLSA are going to be critically important in terms of 
understanding COVID now, tracking things as we move forward, because as we've been talking about, it's not just a, a thing that was, where it's going to happen here and we're just going to move on. These are things that we need to be able to track over time and for the long term. And having data like the CLSA are critically important in being able to do this. So um, we have our questionnaire survey that I described today. We also have a seroprevalence study. And there are, um, the data will be available to all researchers. So if you're thinking about projects and thinking about better understanding things that we can use for knowledge translation. The next um, date of uh, the uh, data access application deadline is September 14th. So I encourage you all to think about things that we can do to inform our way forward. Thank you.